right. So uh, my name is Randy Riley. I'm the state librarian at the Library of Michigan. And this is part of our series of uh, programs we're doing, virtual programs on Michigan Notable Books for 2020. And we are lucky today have to have Dean Kuypers with us, who was uh, the author of this year, um, a book, The Deer Camp, a memoir of a father, a family, and the land that healed them. There's the book right there. Very nice, thank you, Randy. Yeah, Dean was also the author of a, a 2007 Michigan notable book, uh, Burning Rainbow Farm, which is a great book. I hate, you know, I say I love that book, but I didn't love that book. I was moved by that book. The topic and what happened in that story is very disturbing, but that was a great book as well. Yes. Whatever yeah. happened to Rainbow Farm? Uh, the property is still pretty much as it was. Um, there's, I think, one person bought a chunk of it and put a house on it. But other than that, there's, it's pretty much the, it, it was, a, I think, about a 60-acre parcel. And that 60 acres is pretty much still intact. Um, and so, you know, people always have dreams. I hear about every couple of years people saying, hey, we're going to have a festival out there. We're going to do something. But uh, I don't know. We'll see if anything ever happens with that. And you think, how many years ago was that? But the whole pot issue then, if it were today, it, it might not be an done. issue today. Yeah. yeah. It would be it's, nothing because yeah. they, uh, they went after those guys for possession. Yeah. yeah that would crazy. be nothing now. Crazy. You know? But Dean is also the author of Operation Bite Back, which was a 2009 publication. Another great book I recommend folks to check out both of those as as well as the deer camp um, but starting out here just give us some um background on yourself and how do you become a writer how do you get involved in that yeah um well i guess everybody kind of has like a moment when they decide that they can write mine I, I went to hope college for a year and then went to kalamazoo college after that um, but in that first year i took a writing class and um, i was a science nerd and, uh, you know, was it, uh, studying to do pre-med and uh, ke studying chemistry at Hope, and, uh, which I still really love. I still really love all those hard sciences. And I took a writing class, and uh, it went really well. And there was a couple, you know, pieces, little poems and things that I wrote in that class that have stuck with me even to this day. And I thought, huh. And that kind of wrecked everything, because then I couldn't be a doctor. <laughs> And I, I had to go be a journalist, and uh, um, I, but I wasn't. I was inspired to um, write about music at first, and at that time in the eighties, uh, you know, early eighties, that was a time when to be a music journalist was a way to break in. Really, you could. There was a lot of records, and there was a lot of record money, and real and alternative the, music going on at that time exactly. too. There was there was money out there from people buying ads, so that there was a lot of reviews. You could review records and do all that kind of thing. So my first job, I moved to New York City in the, after graduating from Kalamazoo College, and I worked for a magazine called Ear, which was an alternative music magazine, kind of partly classical, partly jazz, partly rock. And there was that whole downtown New York scene with people like Sonic Youth and right. Live Skull and, and that kind of thing. And the whole jazz, like Lounge Lizards, there was this whole John Zorn um, crossover scene happening there. And that's what that magazine was all about. And that was a great entree into that. The first piece I ever did, well, I did a piece on this classical accordionist named William Schimmel, who was very famous. And the second piece I did, I was talking to John Zorn and I was at Radio City. I had been in New York like a week. And I was at Radio City Music Hall and John Zorn was recording and I was talking to Christian Markley, who's a great artist. And we were sitting in the hallway and the Rockettes were across the, the hall like it kicking and practicing yeah. for, the, for the upcoming Christmas thing. And I thought like, why would I do anything other than this? This is fantastic. <laughs> so you, that, and that was you, it. Do you do any music writing anymore or have you kind of switched over to the more ecology yeah well uh that was always it was always kind of a double beat and that i i love to write about music and i love to write about the environment coming from where you know from michigan where i came from i had seen such a successful environmental movement i don't even know if people think of it that way but the 70s yeah. in michigan were unbelievably incredibly successful right. like 
you know, the Rouge River, like, you know, the river in Cleveland and stuff would catch on fire right. in the 60s. And during the 70s, all that got cleaned up uh, to a large extent to the point where in the 80s, when my brothers were graduating from high school, there were trout back in every little creek that had been completely extirpated before. And, you know, crazy things like mink and stuff started to be seen everywhere. And, you know, it was wildly successful. And I had seen that happen. And I wanted to write about that everywhere. I wanted to write about, you know, out west. And I started diving into environmental stories at the same time that I started yeah. writing about music. And that's seeing what's happening today. We could have a whole other discussion about are we taking steps backward from all the, the yes. successes we have. Well, you're out in L.A. now. You spent time in New York City. We still sort of claim you as a Michigan author because of some of your stuff that you did. It's so connected to growing up in West Michigan. Sure. Talk about place. How important is place when you're writing? Place is, um, to me, uh, that's kind of where it starts and ends. Place is everything. I mean, you obviously, you write a novel, you write a story, even that story you mentioned, Rainbow Farm, or the, the book that I have now with uh, the Deer Camp. It's a story of a family, and that's important. That's, those are the characters that you care about and all that, but the whole, the whole thing is informed by place. And there's no, like West Michigan is still where I write. Even, that's where I grew up and I live in LA and I've done you know work in various places all over the world but um, so much of what I think about every day is still in that place so when you think of home where's home is home where you're at now or is home where you grew up or is it a mix of both of those things it's a mix yeah it's a um, I've lived in Los Angeles now longer than I've lived anywhere in the in my life so this obviously is home and you know I have children and it's, it's a great place to be but um, I constantly every single day think about what's going on in southwestern Michigan because that's where so much of what I am grew and that right. those places are stuck in my head and um, the, the, obviously the, the deer camp that we have there now with our cabin and everything constant changes. How often do you, I mean, your writings, uh, how uh, do you do that? Do you do it? Been, oh, uh, sorry. So, anyway, the, I was going to say the, the whole coronavirus lockdown has been advantageous to me in some uh, ways <laughs> because my brother has been sheltering at the cabin and he's a brilliant carpenter. So every day he's like, I don't have nothing to do. So I'm going to like add a new porch onto the, front of the Doesn't house work. or you know he's so he's doing all this great work so when i get back there it's going to be better than ever so has the covid crisis has it changed your i mean your writing style i mean do you take time every day to write or do you get inspirational and take you know write three days straight how do you do it what's your style for for being productive as a writer yeah i write every day i think that you have to even if i wake up and there's a poem or something that's unusual for me to write or i get an idea for an article that i should probably start researching i work on something so you force day. yourself to sit down every day and do something definitely yeah yeah, yeah. and um i don't know i've been doing it so long that now that that's what i want like that's what feels like has to happen every day I, that's what i need to do so i don't have to ever force myself to go into the office and start to type away like I can't wait to get into the office that's where all the good processing and all the thinking happens and then by even if I can get a couple hours of that doing the other stuff of the day feels totally okay like oh, okay that's the stuff I'll just go do while I think about yeah. the next day's writing you know so which writers inspire you or who are you reading or who should we be reading that you think wow. are really really good yeah, um, hmm, good questions. Uh, the, the, when I was working on this book, um, it was very interesting because for me, the deer camp was a, like, was a way to tell a story of a whole bunch of ecological writers that I had been reading for my whole life, basically, since, since at least like 19 or 20 years old. I had been reading some very challenging ecology 
um, philosophers, basically, um, guys like Gregory Bateson. Um, he's difficult to follow. He kind of hops all over uh, with his writing. But he was one of the first people who ever made the connection for me that um, our minds, when I was, in, I was at Kalamazoo College when I was reading him for the first time, that our minds were part of nature. That it wasn't something that's in your head. It's something that actually happens out there. And you're just getting little bits and pieces of it, of this sort of group mentation that's happening <laughs> amongst all the living things. Um, and uh, writing about that really blew my mind. I, in fact, there's one little passage. I always keep it close to me because I don't have it memorized. But, <laughs> but I may even, I, I think I put it in the book, but um, the, there was this book, a wonderful book that he wrote called Steps to an Ecology of Mind which kind of says the whole thing that I'm talking about, right. an ecology of mind. Uh, he says, uh, you decide you want to get rid of the byproducts of human life and that Lake Erie will be a good place to put them, meaning throwing our trash in Lake Erie. Yeah. You forget that the eco-mental system that is Lake Erie is part of your wider eco-mental system and that if Lake Erie is driven insane, its insanity is incorporated into the larger system of your thought and experience. I wrote that down as a little quote when I was in college, and it stayed with me. This all because it it makes the connection. First of all, it's Lake Erie, which I'm totally familiar with, right? And, and it catching on fire in the '60s and all that kind of thing. And uh, but it's about Lake Erie being driven insane by the trash and by the fires and all that, that we're being driven insane by our own behavior and about the stuff that we dump into the lake. So nature, we're not separate from it in any way. It's part of our thinking. See, and that's what I think is great about the deer camp because people, I've, I've read that book, part of the Michigan Notable Books Committee said, this book has to be on the list. It's so Michigan, it's so cool. And then they say, well, what's it about? And it's like, well, <laughs> It's environmental. It's about a father and son. It's about family dynamic. It's about a lot of different things. Yeah. What What made you say, okay, now is the right time to write this very personal book about yeah. the relationship you had with your family, your brothers, your mother, all of that, which some of it is pretty deep, heavy stuff. How come right yeah. now was the time to do that? I had all those these pieces of guys like. Gregory Bates and um, Paul Shepard is another great ecologist that I love to read, you know, his uh, wonderful books about, um, about hunting and about our evolution out of being hunter-gatherers and that, how our minds were created when we were hunter-gatherers in the Ice Ages and so forth. I had all these pieces that kind of flowed with me through life that were about those writers. And um, when my... This experience, and suddenly we had an experience at our deer camp that where I could use it all. It was all like that. There was a story at our camp that told the whole story I was trying to tell about the connection between humans and nature. And, um, you know, the short, the synopsis of that story was that we, we had a, you know, it's a story of a dad. And we had a difficult relationship with our dad. We, we loved him like all, you know, we, I have two brothers, so all three of us. Uh, we loved him like all kids want to love their parents. And he was sometimes a funny guy and, you know, like fun in the outdoors. He took us hunting and fishing and camping and stuff constantly. Like that was where he was good. But he was not that good in the house. And uh, it was rough on my mom. He had a lot of affairs and... Um, he was a respected businessman in Kalamazoo and lots of people know him and stuff, but he didn't have a whole lot of really good friends. And he was just a little, he was a conflicted person. Well, it was interesting and, because you write about him and half the time I'd say, yeah, he's kind of an interesting guy. And half the time it's like, I don't really like this guy very much at all. <laughs> I mean, if I met, if your dad were still alive and I met him, would I say, yeah, he's a charming guy. I like him. Yes. Or he yeah. would. I mean, he, oh, yeah. the outside world loved him. Yeah, yeah. The family might yeah. have been a little more challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, when my mom finally, uh, when I was just done with school at Kalamazoo College and my brother Joe was going into his senior year, my mom divorced him. And uh, it was a long time coming. It should have happened a long time before that. And he, 
he dated and stuff, but he stayed single for a long time, like 15 years or something. It was shocking to him, and he didn't really understand that he had had that much effect on all of us, the, you know, the way it was. And um, he called me the next year, 1989. I had moved to New York to take this job at Ear Magazine. And uh, he said, hey, you know, Kimosabe, which is what he, that's how he always was on the phone. And I wasn't, oh my gosh. Not only that, it's potential spam. <laughs> <laughs> um, forgot to turn my phone off. Uh, um, he called and he said, hey, you know, you got to come out this fall because uh, I got this new deer camp. And I said, well, you know, that's great. We always wanted to have that, like a 40 acres or something where we could all go hunt together. But um, I don't, you know, we're really not on that good of terms right now. So I don't really feel like I want to come out. You know, what are Brett and Joe doing? And they said, oh, yeah, I talk to them all the time. They're coming out. But that also wasn't true. Because <laughs> he was living still in the world like he was, you know, I got these great kids and my family life was awesome. and. It didn't hadn't quite sunk in yet, you know, that there had been problems. Did he just not know how to do it? Yeah, he didn't know how to do it. Yeah, he, he didn't know how to do it. He had me when he was nineteen, and uh, you know, him and my mom they were you know teenagers, and he kind of never grew up. Yeah, and, and I mean, the book's personal, and it's I mean, you lay it out there with things going on with your um, mom, your brother. Friend. Your brothers, the girlfriends, all of that. What's their take on it? How have they received the book and how you sort of laid it out there? Or did they know it was coming? Well, okay, I'm going to answer that. But first, I'm going to continue through with the, the thought that I was pursuing okay. there. One, one second. Okay. That, he had this, this farm, and he, this old farm that he had bought and with, his, with a couple more of my uncles. And this was the, our new deer camp. Right. And um, we didn't want to go. Brett and, went, Brett and Joe went the first year. They said, yeah, it's okay. And then they kind of stopped going. And uh, I never went until, I don't know, like 10 years went by. Seems and like there were a few rules that yeah, had to be followed. <laughs> there were so many rules that they made, and that, that was part of it. But it was mostly that we didn't really want to go there with him and have, that, have him sort of reimpose the entire home situation again. And the 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 reason i wanted to write this story is um it changed in you know in 2000 or so my brother brett took some forestry classes and he kind of took the lead he said i i want my dad back he said i you know he said and he was and he would say it like that he said i i really we don't have a, the dad that we always wanted and i think we can get it and dad doesn't even want it but i want it and so he spearheaded that and he started pushing my dad saying, hey, let us restore this place. Because the place was kind of a wreck. It was very sandy and just had some pine trees and stuff. And um, it could have been a lot better for habitat, for grouse and deer. Right. And, so and uh, he, Brett showed him the whole layout. Like, here's what you do. We'll take down some aspens and we'll let those regrow, which is standard practice for habitat management in Michigan and Wisconsin and stuff. And my dad just said, absolutely not. We're not touching it. You guys will ruin it. I hate this idea. And he wouldn't let us do it. And um, I was in, and Joe was in, and he finally, after several years, we were all just going to quit. And we were like, we're not going to come there anymore. I had a young son, and I thought, it's such a great place to go, but I don't want to participate in this. All the this, negativity. This dynamic. It's so negative. And uh, finally, he relented. And said, "Fine, you know, ruin the place." And uh, uh, for about a year, it was pretty rough because we logged, and that was just awful. And my dad just looked at it and was practically sobbing, like, "Oh, you guys just destroyed this place. It'll never grow back. That sand won't grow anything." And um, you know, and I'll read a piece about that later. But that that if the next year, trees came up, of course. Yeah, which was I mean, the most normal thing in the world, and my dad changed. Like, and you write about that really well. I mean, you in the story you tell that how the rebirth of that land is like a rebirth of your dad, and where he, I don't know, maybe 
you're always a son to your father, but he sort of stopped seeing you guys as little boys yeah. and as men who had something to offer besides yeah. being a trophy of look at how good my kids are. Yeah. It was, it was I mean, it was, I thought you did it very well in the book. It, it really, the it dynamic so, of the family. He was blown away. You can, you can, you could see it on his face when he was out there. He was just awestruck that trees came up and we had changed the, he was afraid to change anything and that we had changed the landscape and stuff grew and more animals started coming. The deer started, population started going up and all this, and he just couldn't believe it. And the better that place got, and, it, and we worked hard there. I mean, anybody, any of you have come up on a farm or you know about like doing forestry work where it's, you're constantly dragging logs through the woods and trees fall on you and you know, like, Crazy stuff happens. Yeah, it's not uh, vacation at the deer. It's camp. not vacation. <laughs> no, it's like we go there and everybody has a collection of like old ripped up clothes that you put on those clothes and you go out in the woods. It's work. It's work. And the more we worked, the better it got. Our relationship got better. The place got better. Uh, the last five years I had with my dad were spectacular. And that's why I wanted to write it. And and, you know, you mentioned, you know, how did the family right. react and all that. Uh, my mom didn't really want to get into it at first because there was stuff there about my dad's infidelities. and She had pretty much tried to tamp that down and not talk about that in the world, you know. Um, she and I were looking through some photos and I said, well, I'm going to write something about this extraordinary experience that Brett and Joe and I had with dad at the camp. And we were talking about pictures and going through photos and stuff. And finally, one day, she just kind of was like, do you, do you really want to know what happened? And I was like, I kind of need to know. And she said, okay. And the first thing she told me was, you know, when I was a baby, about nine months old, probably, I had just started walking. Dad got a girlfriend from the bowling alley or whatever and just left and we lived in Seattle and he was at Payne Field in the Air Force and he just gone for three months or something didn't send any money didn't say where he was he was somewhere around Seattle checked up with somebody else and then came back and was kind of angry like isn't there any dinner left or you know something like it didn't what you know don't dare talk about it but I'm back now you know, and that, and this became the pattern for many years. And of course, I was a baby. I didn't know that. But when we were about 11 or so, when I was 11, um, my brothers were then, you know, whatever, six and five or something, um, they split up finally. And when, when that happened, I started to see all the, the dynamics. Um, and they were split up for about three years. And during that time, I got to see dad with an apartment and the girlfriends and all that kind of thing. So then I kind of figured out as about when I was about 12, like what had been going on. But once mom started telling me the stories, it's, it's so important to you as a child because it started to make all these things that I knew about but suspected and didn't really right. know the detail. It all started to make sense. And um, for my brothers too, they didn't know most of those stories. And, um, so I started gathering all that, and uh, I think there was a part of my mom that didn't want those stories known, but there was a part of her that needed them to be known, because she's the one who took all the heat. Well, and for me as a reader, she is one of the, the people in the book that I really connected with. It's like she was such a kind of of her time of what a lot of women had to do, but there was this strength in her. and her connection with the three of you that was really special and, and beautiful and powerful. Um, right. Right. You know, she's kind of the unsung hero of the whole story, at, at least when I read it. Right. And part of the book for me became to, to, uh, to sing the unsung hero um, because uh, she needed to, you know, she divorced him and there was a, her, my dad's family basically just turned their back on her and said like, you know, you're, you're out of our life. And that was like that for decades. And then it's better now. But, um, you know, there were some people in my family who said, why do you want to, why do you want to dig up all this old dirt and everything? Why don't you just 
let that go and let reputations go and you know and just let it be what it is and I said wait I want to write about it because it changed yeah. and and Bruce my dad became such a great guy and we needed him to be a great guy and he and he suddenly you know in his 50s felt it and was like oh my gosh I can be a different person and he was yeah and through the work at the deer camp you guys helped teach him how to be a better person it yes. gave him that that vehicle of, of change, which is, you know, one of the really cool things about the book is that whole process and you see it happening. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, it was, you know, both, a, it was everything that I had been reading about for 20 or 30 years. And it was a, it was a, in, it was a mental change in our family because right. we had, you know, you could characterize what was happening with us as sort of mental illness. In a way, <laughs> because we 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 had we struggled so mightily with him to try to get along and to try to be in the same room with him, and even amongst ourselves, yeah, checking out was, in different ways. Yeah, and there was tensions and all this stuff, and then um, you know, then working on this sort of ecological problem of restoring the land and making the sand produce new trees and all that kind. Of Which is, um, which is fantastic for me to think about. And once I started to put that all together and I presented that to my brothers, like, I'm thinking about writing it like this. They're like, oh, yeah, we didn't really see it that way. But that's really interesting. So go for it. And I had to interview them a lot to get the facts because there was stuff that happened to them and interactions they had with my dad when I wasn't right. around. Because right. I was the older brother and I left and went yeah. to New York and stuff. So. There was a lot of interviewing and re-interviewing to get all the facts right. So how was it to see him with your son? I mean, because I'm reading and saying, hey, Bruce, why weren't you like that with Dean and Joe and Brett? But I guess he finally got it in the end, and that's all that's important. But yeah. part of you had to say, where was that Bruce when I needed that Bruce? Well, it was interesting because I didn't – It even then – my son was born in 1999, and it was about 2003 or four when he really changed. And so when my son first showed up out there at the camp, it was still the same Bruce. Was it? it was, yeah, he was kind of like, it was so great. We'll get Spencer, my son, he was, we'll get Spencer a little camo outfit, and, you know, we'll get him a BB gun, and we'll get him all the stuff. But, like, my mom, one of the little bits I had in the book is my mom proposed, like, oh, why don't you guys build a treehouse? Right. Out there. And he said, my dad was like, oh, yeah. And then about a few minutes later, he's like, no, no, we don't put anything in the trees. Like, we don't want to change anything. We don't want to mess up one of, well, he always just said booger up. We don't want to booger up one of the trees. And we're like, what? really? Like on 95 acres, there's not one tree where you can build a treehouse for a little kid? And that, that stuff is all part of what changed with him, you know, down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a single message people should get out of reading the deer camp or is it multi-layered? Like I said, it's, it's environmental. It's about habitat. It's about father's sons and brothers and moms. And it's, it's multiple things. Yeah. Uh, I think there is. And that is um, it's, the, your family. We all thought we could just kind of walk away from Bruce and it just wouldn't matter in our lives. But once we started re-engaging with him, even though it was difficult, we realized we couldn't. That that relationship, the relationships you have with your parents, with your siblings, with people in your extended family even, um, they are you. They're, they're not you, and if there's, you know, you have conflicts with them, you can break apart and probably be semi-okay, but um, it really does matter that relationship you have to them and the fact that that got better for us changed our lives i mean we could have gone on and just kind of been like yeah you know home life kind of sucked and all that but when it got so much better we realized how important it really was and how satisfying and how fulfilling that was to kind of have a dad back that we really wanted and um the you know i don't know that everybody of course like it's ridiculous and privileged to say that, oh, people are going to go out and get yourself a deer camp and, you 
know, this 40 acres of land and work on it together. Obviously, that's not going to happen for most people. But um, uh, putting a project together with your family is something that's so fantastically worthwhile and satisfying. And um, anybody, it could be anything. You could, you know, whatever it is, you know, it could be painting the house, it could be something. If there's some way you can engage with that difficult person in your family, it's worth doing. That's really what I wanted people to take away from that was, if you can do it in nature, maybe there's an even better route there, but right. there's gotta be some way. Yeah. yeah, there's gotta be some way that you can reach those people. And um, when I do talks out in the, the, you know, in the world, in bookshops and so forth, um, almost invariably there's like two or three guys in the back who, are, who raise their hands at the end it's like, my dad was really difficult. <laughs> and that's, that's how the next, that's how the rest of our conversation for that night will go. And that's okay. That's exactly what I thought would probably happen because people want to find a way to fix that relationship. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think I'm ruining the book for people to say Bruce is no longer with us. No. And then just, I mean, you guys were able to establish a relationship that when he passed away, you're not beating yourself up over, I should have done this and why didn't right. I have that conversation? You guys right. were able through that deer camp, through that whole process of working and fixing it, actually have those heart to heart, genuine conversations with your father, which is, I mean, a real blessing. I mean, when you look at how this all, all happened in the end, I mean, yeah. there wasn't much left to say to Bruce. No, that hasn't just, been said. No, there were just, uh, you know, we were sad because, uh, you know, he died relatively young, obviously 64 or 65. I Getting think. younger all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, we just anticipated there would be a lot more years of just having yeah. fun, like having the good times. But that was, we talked about that. We went out to the spot where he had died and we talked about how there was really nothing left unsaid. There wasn't something that like, oh, I wish I would have talked to dad about this or, or asked about that because we had kind of gone through it. Um, which is, I, get, which is, I do get asked a lot whether or not I would have written the book if he hadn't died. And I, I, and, and I think that I would. Because okay. that change was so fantastic, um, but it definitely would have been different because I would have had to confront him about all so, this stuff. And our relationship had gotten pretty good, but that would have been the test, I'm sure. Yeah, to, to come at him with all the infidelities and stuff and say, "What happened here? Like, can you talk about?" It? I don't know if he would have. Yeah, yeah. But, he was a proud guy, so that probably would have been hard. Right. Right. Is is there a passage you'd like to read from the book here now? Sure, sure. Yeah, that would be uh, great. If you would do that, that would be fantastic. I I think I'll read about um, when I was uh, when we were still in the middle of the struggle, right? When I was fifteen, obviously everybody struggles with their parents when they're fifteen years old. But uh, my dad, uh, he believed in you know he had just come back to the family. They split up between the time I was like eleven and fourteen or something. I just turned 15 and he was just back in the house and his big idea was that we were going to build a brand new house out in the woods and um, typical for him we were going to go further away from any people any community all the ladies that my mom hung out with in our little neighborhood that we were in we wanted to get away from all them because they knew about all this bad stuff you know right so he was going to take us out in the woods and build this big new house but um he decided that my summer job would be I was going to clear the land. And so he. he You're he lucky got, you survived it. Uh, totally lucky, yeah, because there were chainsaws involved and it <laughs> got ugly. And uh, so he bought me a chainsaw and, uh, um, and a Farm All 400 tractor cultivator to pull trees with and, you know, some sundry tools and a thermos of coffee and put me out there the whole summer. Have at it. And just said, I just want all this area cleared, trees, everything's got to go. So it was a big slash pile. Yeah. Uh, piece of property at some point in the past. And so this is me on the slash pile when I'm 15 years old and struggling with the family religion and 
trying to figure all this out with my dad. At lunch, I would sit on a stump and think about the muck. The life in the moldy, slimy stumpage was rich and black. The bugs and fungus and salamanders there seemed loud. The pile stood in direct contrast to the sterile fields I had walked all day on the flower farm where I had worked the previous summers. Everything in, the, in that gray dun soil had been killed except for the crops. It was dead silent. The old patriarch of the flower farm where I had worked, Fred Nagel, had separated the world into useful and non-useful species. For him, farming was a cosmic battle, an apocalyptic war between a god who fed his people and a Satan who commanded legions of demons. That nutgrass is from the devil, he would say, and we battle Satan for our very lives. And all the Nagel kids would roll their eyes. But I thought about what he said as I walked through those fields where all the fence rows had been long torn out and even the ditches were mowed and sprayed. I thought about how many people felt the way Grandpa Nagel did, that we were at war with nature, that it was our mission to, as a species to eradicate all the others. Dad would come out to the land on the weekends while I worked, sometimes for the day, sometimes for five minutes, and he was delighted to see the hole in the forest growing. He would power up the chainsaw and swing it like a scythe, mowing down brambles, then get bored and usually get back in his car and leave. We once spent one weekend pulling out flowering dogwoods with the tractor because they form an understory. He didn't want anything to block his views. I want to see through the trees, he said. He'd also taken down big sumacs and slippery elm and tulip trees, and others he thought were no good compared with the hickory and beech and oak. Somehow, Dad and Old Nagel both agreed that God wanted them to clear the land and make way for clean thoughts and deeds, reduce its complexity, banish the useless species. I was finding the opposite. Working in that rotten slash pile, I thought it was perfectly obvious that nature favored moreness, not lessness. More species of tree and frog and bug and fungus, not less. More exchange of communication between them. Everything in that slash heap was very explicit about its desire to live. All you had to do was grab onto a little dogwood tree with both hands and pull, and you would feel it tugging back. A place was richer or poorer because of the number of exchanges that went on there, all of which fired the imagination. I wasn't sure what God was or if it existed, but if all things were an extension of God, then its fullest expression was more, not less. I was starting to talk with the minister of the new church Dad had joined, Pastor Stoll, and I understood there was a tension in God between oneness and manyness. The oneness, God as a unity, I might never see, but God as manyness was right there before my eyes. Life and God and nature expressed themselves through difference and diversity. There had to be a difference in order for two things to talk to each other, two different people, one tree talking to the other tree through the white threads of fungus that connect trees. If there wasn't any communication between things, then there was no world. The world wasn't actually made of things, it was made of the communication between things. Working in the woods, I was like a demolition expert, defusing a bomb, cutting the wires one by one, diminishing God a little at a time every day, making the world too safe. Every farmer and pretty much every human being everywhere was doing the same thing, clearing their little patch, not thinking it will matter much, replacing the chatter with silence. It got to where I was disgusted with myself in my role in this treachery. I wanted to make the world louder. I wanted to sneak a couple wolves or pumas into the thicket and watch imaginations explode all over the township. Yeah, that's good stuff. And, uh, and later how you got rid of that pile is a, a story unto itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, people can have a little foretaste. My dad decided it was a good idea to burn it. <laughs> we almost lost the entire forest. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you compare yourself to other writers, you know, whether they're friends or, or writers that you admire, um, and we talked a little bit about this, but how did growing up in West Michigan and some of those experiences like you just described, how did that or did it at all shape you as a writer? Is your perspective slightly different because of the world you grew up in West Michigan? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because you develop a facility with being um, in the 
you know, what we think of as being the wilder world, but being in the forest, knowing what animals are, knowing what hurts you and what doesn't hurt you. When I would go out in the, in, you know, friends of mine from college, for instance, would visit like where I lived and stuff. You can see it right away, the people who are comfortable and say like, oh, let's go for a walk in the nature or whatever, and the people who weren't comfortable because they just didn't have any experience with that, which wasn't, it was like me showing up in New York City for the very first time. Right. You know, it was like completely overwhelming because I had no idea what you did there, how that all worked. Because I had never really been in a city since I was a baby. Um, but that, that definitely shapes you because uh, we were, you know, with my family, with my dad, the safe thing to talk about in this religious and politically conservative family is um is nature that's the safe thing to talk about so every family gathering every christmas and so forth um it would be uh you know oh did you see the did you hear about that fox that's been living under our house and uh, did you see that giant deer that's been walking through the back of you know burns yard and all that that's what everyone would talk about and then you wouldn't you wouldn't have any troubles so we grew up acutely aware of habitat Everywhere you went, you're driving down the road. I still do it to this day. I look at everything as habitat. I look at all oh, that cornfield. On the edge of the cornfield is the place where the deer is going to step out. And, oh, there! Oh, that's the hawk nest. But constantly aware of it at all times. Even here at the house in LA, you know, I I have a tiny little hawk. I think it's a shark shin that that blasts through next to my office and goes under the carport chasing pigeons. And I, you know, I've seen about six or 10 times and I bring it up to other people. I say, I think we have like a little churchian or, or maybe it's a small cooper or something. And people are like, really? I never saw never that. I noticed that. Yeah. yeah. But it's there. And um, that changes you forever. And I'm um, aware of what the crops are and are they tall or low for this time of year? Like right now, there's a bit of a drought in southern Michigan. Right. So I understand that the corn is kind of struggling. Yeah. I'm thinking about that. I don't even live there anymore. It's it's part. It becomes part of who, of how your mind works. So the seasons are happening, even when I'm living in a place that kind of doesn't have strong seasons. seasons. I mean, you talked about you know the dad and the family, the link always. Even when your relationship wasn't what you wanted it to be, the the outdoors, the hunting, it was always there, and that was kind of the three brothers and dad. You always had that. What would a sister or sisters have done to that dynamic, do you think? Would it have changed your dad in any way? Because he wouldn't have been able to say, well, maybe he would still try to say, hey, let's go out and hunt or whatever. Or would it have softened him in ways that you guys couldn't or it didn't happen with his boys? I think it, I think it would have been a great thing to have a sister um, in that I think it would have made things my my father probably would have loved that to have like a little girl and somebody that he could dote on and you know who would buy you know clothes and do all that. he would have loved all that stuff because he was a first of all when he died he had like a hundred suits so he was a clothes <laughs> guy you know and that kind of thing but it wouldn't have changed the outdoorsy part because yeah. my uncles in my family the women hunt and fish and do all the stuff the same as the men. My mom was not really a participant in that. She was too busy trying to keep the house together and all that. But my aunt, you know, in our deer camp, the first person who shot a buck deer in our camp was my aunt Sally. They still sit out way more than I'll ever sit out. My aunt Jane, all the daughters have all hunted in Africa. Like it, okay. all, it wouldn't have made any difference. The, yeah, the girls and boys went out together. So um, it's one of the, actually one of the great things, you know, about hunting and fishing is that it can be an equalizer like that. And that, I think that's true of most of the families I grew up with. Well, that's the whole thing, the question too of, of hunting and, you know, what attracts you to hunting and, you know, you're living in New York and you're living in LA and I mean, you're at a Sonic Youth show. There's not a whole lot of deer hunters usually in that crowd. How is, I mean, for you as a sportsman, I mean, how's that? I mean, I, rem I, I do not hunt. My father was, but I fly fish, and I remember a lot of times 
friends would say, you're getting up to do what tomorrow? When I said, no, I got to go in and go to bed. I got to get up trout fishing tomorrow. Do you yeah. have those kind of discussions of people of course. who don't yeah. get it? And how yeah. do you explain, hey, you're killing deer? Why would you kill a deer? Most of the time, uh, surprisingly, most of the time it goes the other way. People think it's fantastic. And the first thing they say is, can you take me out oh, there? Really? Yeah. Most of the time, that's the reaction I get. Um, which is surprising, but after a while has become not so surprising. I see that people, look, most of the people in the world, uh, you know, still eat meat. And um, if you're eating meat, you make the connection right away. Like this is the most ethical and direct and organic and, you know, fresh way to get the meat that you're gonna get is to kill it yourself. And I don't even like to say like, oh, you know, you go harvest it or anything like that. Right. We kill animals, that's what we do. But um, the rest of the time I eat vegetarian because I don't like to buy it at the store. I don't like the idea of the way somebody may have raised a cow, even though there are very, very good cattle farmers out there and you could get grass fed beef and you could make it. Right. You, know, you could get the fanciest, best raised piece of beef you could possibly imagine. It, it's available. And that's probably a good thing to buy if you buy if you eat meat because that's going to encourage them to do better farming practices. But I don't like the idea of you know cows on a feedlot. Right. And I valley in California, um, standing in a big pile of manure and all that kind of. I would rather go have the direct experience where I get the animal myself. I have to kill it. I have to dress it. I have to deal with it. I have to. Um, acknowledge that it's, it was there on our property and could come and go freely. We basically gave it a habitat. Right. And then, you know, there's probably 15 of them or something that come and go through a place and we take one. See, and I think my dad and, and Bruce could have had a long conversation about, um, you know, the poachers and the slob hunters and the whatever. But I think sometimes the sportsmen who are into to hunting are some of the biggest environmentalists that you'll ever oh, find sure. because they see that connection to taking yeah. care of the land and what that means yeah. to wildlife and everything else, not just animals, but wildflowers and trees yeah. and a clean river and all of that. And my yeah. dad was big into that as well. No, for sure. That's why Michigan got cleaned up in the seventies. Like I was saying, it was sportsmen yeah. who, who funded the bulk of that and said hey we need to clean this up because there's nothing you know the deer herd was nothing there were no trout left but like the um the management that we do on our property where you it's basically aspen management you take down a stand of aspens maybe 10 um, acres and then you let it grow back and in the five to ten years it grows back that's prime habitat for grouse for um, woodcock for deer and other things too, like bears like it and you know beavers like it. We have all that stuff. So, but what I don't think that people are aware of the fact that that is a management strategy that's being used by the DNR as well. So they'll drive by a place and say, "Oh, they logged that." They, they're not quite aware of the fact that they logged it on purpose to let it grow back. Right. And that there's this active management going on everywhere. The beauty of it is, like my brother and I. We do that for grouse. We love grouse. We hardly ever shoot one off our place, though. We love to hear, you know, you hear the, yeah. the grouse, you know, that, that thumping in the spring with it. In the See, chest. for me, it's a pheasant crawling, brings yeah. back memories. It's like. When we were young, oh, it was pheasants. You, yeah. you, you watched every field, and like some, certain fields, the, the grass was the exactly perfect height. Right. You know, okay, that's a pheasant field. You know? Right. Um, but we, my brother and I talk about it, and. Uh, Brett and I, like, if we had to stop hunting, we would still continue the management because exactly. that has become the practice now. That's what we do. Like, we're like farmers. We farm wildlife. And we're, and we don't, we're not we're not going to stop just because, like, oh, I can't hunt one. Like, oh, I'm going to stop doing that now. We'll just keep on doing it. Which is and, really cool. Yeah, and I think that that's what, you know, so many trout guys, like, you know, you're a fly fisherman. They belong to Trout Unlimited. They'll turn up a couple days a year to help do a stream rehabilitation where you're building wind dams in the stream and stuff like that. All that stuff is really, really useful. 
and, um, and connects you. You spend a day working on the Manistee River, um, you care about the Manistee River forever. Right. And you talk about in your book how sometimes you would, it would kind of baffle your dad. You'd just go out and sit in the blind and watch things. And I mean, similar to when I fly fish, I like to catch fish. But sometimes just being where trout live is a really great place to spend a day just sure. taking all that in. And the same thing of sitting in a blind and watching all that happen, especially when you were part of building it, has to yeah. be extremely satisfying. Yeah, my brother Joe now has a cabin on the, the Manistee, like way up near the sort of the headwaters of the Manistee River, which is so beautiful. And a lot of times, he'll, he's a master fly fisherman, but a lot of times he just put his boots on and just go walk up the river. Yeah. And just look and look at habitat and you know, he's out. pretty good at it. So he'll see like, oh, I know there's a big fish under that one. Yeah. Just, just to go, just to be in it. And the, where the fish bump into your boots sometimes, all that kind of thing. That's a beautiful place to be. So to you, I mean, to us, the Michigan Notable Books Program is a way that the Library of Michigan, the State Library of Michigan, can shine the spotlight on 20 books about Michigan and, and encourage people to read about the state, which I think has, every year I'm just amazed about the great stories that focus on our state. Sure. What's it mean to you to be selected or have your book selected as a Michigan Notable Book? It's, it's really important, and I, I commend those the library for having this program and they should do this everywhere because of the idea you brought up originally the idea of place the place is so important and the idea that people can pick up a book and go oh this happened here that it makes a difference um it, it obviously some of the great stories that happen in the world they might happen somewhere else it doesn't make it not a great story but right. you connect to it like People ask me all the time when I come to readings, there's always somebody in the back of the room or hand who asks, you know, where exactly are you in Oceana County? Because that matters to them. They want to have the picture in their mind, you know, how far are you from Fremont and blah, like where? Right. Because they either they know it or they, they want to look it up on a map or whatever. The place actually matters. And to have that, um, to know that, you know, Hemingway was writing about, you know, Petoskey area right. or Tom McGuane's first book, you know, the, the sporting club was about one of those Michigan clubs that I encountered when I was a boy, you know, that or Jim Harrison, who I got to know later in his life, that was right around in that area where our cabin is. That's where a lot of that writing happened and a lot of those landscapes. Are, that, that stuff matters. Bonnie Campbell, you know, yeah. Once Upon a River. That that I know that river, right. like it's a fictional river, <laughs> the one she's, but it's not because I I know what it is, you know, and I know a little bit about where she lives and so so in my imagination I go there and it, it's important that the that those works are connected to a place. Yeah, and, and the like Michigan Notable Books program <laughs> is connecting all of these books to a place, which I love. And like I said earlier, we still claim you as a Michigan man. So uh, know that you're welcome back in state anytime. And we would love to hear you uh, read from your works. They're great. And as we're kind of wrapping up here, you know, if you had to tell somebody, um, I want to hear you read again another section from your book. But if people aren't familiar with your work or if they're saying, oh, this book sounds kind of interesting, um, what would you say? What could encourage? Hey, here's why you should take a look at this book. What might that reason be? because it's important for us to maintain our connection between nature and the human race. And um, more and more, we live on media. You and I are doing it right now. <laughs> We're on a Zoom call. Um, that, and we think about it, and I see it especially in the younger people in our family, you know, we have three kids, that they're living in the media, they're walking around with their phone and they're looking at it, so, but not entirely. Uh, you know, my one son is now in the California Conservation Corps, and he's climbing trees today, learning how to like lop the branches off the trees with a little chainsaw. You know, you got to climb the tree. Right. It's I'm so proud that that can happen. Another one's working on a farm. You know, that you have to maintain that connection because there's a real world out there, and that's what happened with us. Was the, once we got away from 
other parts of our life and got into the dirt, our relationship got better. And I think that's going to be true of just about everyone. Right. And you mentioned not everyone's going to have the opportunity to have a deer camp like you. But I say the local park, if you sit down there long enough, watch the birds, the squirrels, the whatever, there's stuff happening that if you take the time. Yeah. And then, and then opening of the book when my dad calls i'm a guy who hangs out in Tompkins square park in new york yeah. city like that was my nature yeah you, know? you, you learn from it is there a closing section you want to read from the book sure. and get shared with us sure i'll read about the part where i show when my dad changed i'm going to read that little part okay um so the setup is, uh, once again, that we, you know, we, we were trying to grow this, we, we cut a bunch of trees down, and my dad was completely distraught. It was about seven acres of trees, and we cut them, and it looked like hell. And there, he went around, he actually went around the forest and tried to make little piles of all that leftover branches and stuff, trying to clean it up, like to control it in some way. Uh, and so I went away, we were gone for a year, nothing happened, I didn't hear anything about the land. I just thought it was destroyed and we had failed and my dad, we would never have a relationship. So um, I was researching my other book, Rainbow Farm, and I went up to visit the land. I banged through the screen door of the cabin and into the mudroom with my bag. Before I could get a look at the early evening fields, dad came in the sliding door. I took a deep breath. When I saw him, I realized that I had been expecting bad news about the Scots pines and the aspens that it had all gone to sand or had produced a field of pure bull thistle or knapweed or something. I expected him to be a wreck. My boy, Dad explained, and he wrapped me in a big hug. Hi, Pop, I said, preparing for a brief embrace, but he wouldn't let me go. We stood there in a clench under the taxidermied head of Aunt Sally's old buck, and he said, I love you, and kissed the side of my face. Last time my father had kissed me was probably a quarter century earlier, when I was 16, and he and I were both baptized for the congregation, which, for the record, had been Dad's third baptism, a sprinkle, dunk, sprinkle, sweet that had to look a little suspect on the big board where they keep track of that kind of thing. Dad had a lot of things to be happy about that spring. First and foremost, his wedding to Diane, and maybe it made him a little gushy. She had also been coaching him on being less rigid, less controlling, because she knew like we did that it was crippling him. But something else was happening. Dad's face was different. His shoulders, his posture, I'd never seen him so good in his own skin. It took me a minute. I kept thinking it was a matter of facial hair or a better fitting shirt, but it eluded me. It's so good to be here, I said. Oh, it's so good that you took the effort to get out here. It's so important to your brothers. And look at this place, it's just perfect. Now my dad always kept all the blinds closed on the cabin because he didn't like it that the animals could see us inside. That was one of the control things, right? So you could never open the blinds, you could never open the curtain, and at night all the lights had to be off because he didn't want the animals to know there were people inside the cabin. All the blinds were up, The drapes were pulled back, and the spring wind blew straight through the open windows to lift and drop the pull cords against the wall over and over, where they rattled like someone throwing dice on a table. The red oaks shook their catkins in the current, and the tips of the pines glowed yellow-white as they heaved out their pollen cones and prepared to dust the swamps to the east. The coming twilight flowed cool and sweet all over the carpet. It hit me then that Dad hadn't allowed the gap between him and those fields to close. At least for this moment, the forest pushed itself up against him and he didn't grimace or constantly dust himself off or slam the window shut. He was exposed, fully exposed, and he was turning his face into the breeze out of the southwest. He was letting it turn him. After a minute, he turned away from the windows and put water on for tea. Something in him had released. You can stay another day, the steelhead are running in the Manistee, he said. Brett's got most of the early planting done. I could see to the west where the five acres of Scott's Pines had been. We had cut those. The low angle sun shot through it and flared out the window, flared on the window. Dad held up one finger and then he pointed out the tiny kitchen window. 
toward the east, and we both stopped to listen to a grouse drumming on the old drumming log on the east side of the swamp. When the thumping fluttered out, I said, let's go look at those cuts. Did anything come up? What, said Dad, looking confused. I said, the Scots pines cut, the aspen cuts. How's it looking? Oh, great, there's a whole new forest out there. I said, what? Why didn't anyone tell me? He goes, oh, yeah, it all came up. I said, weren't you worried? Aren't you overjoyed? You were so worried. Shit. I was never worried, he said, straight face. Those cuts are going to fill in and be fabulous. The way he said it, it sounded like false enthusiasm, like a form of denial. I didn't know how to take it. Dad was acting weird. He never said the word fabulous. He seemed a little unmoored. Maybe the logging had broken his mind. Maybe the spring with the big building, the wedding, the new wing he put on his house for his wife, Diane, had been too much for him. I tugged open the slider, and we walked off the porch and started out there. Great. And what happens, of course, is we find trees growing. <laughs> yeah. And that, changes his, and that changes his whole life. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's a great book. Again, I recommend everyone, if you have not, The Deer Camp is a great story. Dean Kuypers, thank you for being part of the Michigan Notable Books program. Let's go fly fishing sometime when you're in Michigan. I would love it. Yes, thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate it. And take it care. Um, and good. also, do look. Dean's other books, Burning Rainbow Farm and Operation Bite Back, two by that I've read that are outstanding. Take a look at those as well. They're fantastic. Dean, thank, thank you, so you again. Have a great day. Stay safe out there. Thank you. You too. Appreciate All right. it. All right. Bye-bye.